Hello, everyone. Uh, today, in the subject of medical microbiology, we are going to study about the principles and concepts that are involved in uh, biosafety. Right. Uh, so, the outcome of this uh, very topic or the very lecture is that you should uh, understand being a student of uh, medical microbiology what are the principles that are inculcated in biosafety. Right. So, here you are expected. Uh, to learn the fundamental applications of uh, biosafety that are employed everywhere in the regulations. So, coming on to the principles and concepts of biosafety. Biosafety is the prevention of large-scale loss of the biological integrity focusing both on ecology and humanity. Right. So, uh, when it comes to integrity, the integrity means complete balance. So there should always be a balance in the ecology and the So any disruption in the balance uh, uh, significantly uh, affect the health of others and especially the health of humans. But uh, these prevention mechanisms include conduction of the regular reviews of biosafety in laboratory settings as well as uh, strict guidelines. So here you can see that uh, we should always, when you are working in laboratory and in close contact with the passenger, so uh, regular reviews of biosafety uh, are essentially needed in the laboratory settings because you are all, all, always surrounded by uh, complex uh, and complicated technologies and their instruments. And uh, you should always take care of them because they can uh, alter any time. So, Always auditing and inspection is required. Biosafety is used to protect uh, from harmful incidents. Many laboratories handling biohazards employ an ongoing risk management system and enforcement process of biosafety. So, uh, whenever you are dealing with uh, these things, whenever you are dealing with such issues, uh, so, so the system has been designed uh, so that there should be a continuous process of evaluation when it comes to the safety of the laboratory and there should be a uh, continuous series of uh, inspection of handling of biohazardous material. Okay, it should always be handled because assessment and enforcement of process of biosafety and protocols regarding to that is very important. So, if the protocols are uh, not being followed, then the situation can uh, really be odd or really be dangerous for the people. Failure to follow such protocols can lead to increased risk of exposure to biohazards or pathogens. So, uh, uh, one should always follow these guidelines and uh, one should always be aware of such issues that in what context uh, these things are necessary to be followed, in what context they are required to take place. Okay, there are uh, certain systematic protocols that are always required to be followed by the individuals who are working in the laboratory. If they are not at all following those protocols, the, uh, anytime, anywhere, can uh, any incident can take place that can uh, result in uh, a pandemic or epidemic outbreak or a worse situation. So, uh, they are all meant for the safeguarding process or the uh, safeguarding of that very uh, establishment and that, uh, that very passageing entity. Because uh, when you are working on the safety, you should always be aware of that how you should handle those things and how should uh, you uh, you should be having a very good amount of training so here you can see a scientist wearing a full body suit and the cable has been connected uh, to uh, provide him the uh, his own unique atmosphere and inside that suit he is always wearing the PPE kit okay so and here you can see that he the constantly working on uh, biosafety uh, cabinets okay so uh, this section defines the biosafety concepts including biohazardous material virulence 
rules of entry, viability, infectious flows, concentration, immune status, and biosafety containment levels. BSL 1 to 4 and ABSL 1 to 4. So, uh, what is the meaning of the uh, term called containment level? Containment level is the level uh, where you always have to constrain and restrict a pathogenic agent working uh, while working in the laboratory. So, you are uh, not at all involving it to escape out of the laboratory, right? And infectious agent risk. So, RG124, uh, they, this is the basic classification of pathogenic microorganisms that uh, include from the category that is uh, least pathogenic to the category which is the most pathogenic towards the humans. And uh, you can see that uh, the scientist is uh, carefully working on the safety cabinet and uh, how they are uh, carrying out all the scenarios. So, a biohazardous material. What is a biohazardous material? Biohazardous material are any microorganisms or infectious substance or naturally occurring bioengineered or uh, synthesized component of any of such organisms or infectious substance capable of causing a death, disease, or biological malfunctions in humans. An animal, a plant, or another living organism. So, uh, biohazardous material is uh, mostly of pathogenic nature, and it can be a microorganism that have been uh, safeguarded in the laboratory for the process of experimentation, for the principle of experimentation procedures. Right. So, uh, whenever you are dealing with such uh, uh, Pathogenic agents, you, know, you should ensure that your laboratory designs and your laboratory technology is up to the mark. Right? If you are not having uh, those kind of designs and patterns of protection and protocols that are uh, that should be followed, then uh, they may create a very hazardous condition. So sometimes these pathogens are bioengineered for the purpose of biological warfare. So Deterioration of food, water, equipment supplies, or material of any kind. Mm -hmm. Harmful alteration of environment. So, any type of alteration is really very dangerous in, this, in these conditions. Right? So, uh, whenever you are dealing with such scenarios, such fashion, you should always make sure that everything is uh, properly sealed, proper, properly marked, and up to the level of perfection. Okay, it should not be like that any uh, instrument in the laboratory is not working properly, any instrument is malfunctioning or anything like that. So here you can see the uh, biohazard symbol and what does it represent biosafety and what are the tripod uh, factors, practices and measures. Okay. So you should always have good hands-on training before working in those levels of laboratory. Uh, personal procedures badly. So you should always be suited up properly and you should be fully aware about the hands-on training and what are the basic procedures and processes that you should uh, undertake for your protection. Primary and secondary badly. They include your uh, full body suit and PPE kit that you wear inside and the gloves and eyewear that you are always wearing. So, uh, whenever you are working in such laboratory conditions, uh, it is essentially very much required for you to keep all these things in your mind. So, uh, BSL-1, BSL-2, BSL-3 and BSL-4 are the uh, levels of laboratory uh, that are uh, significantly uh, employed uh, for the experimentation procedures and experimentation purposes. Right. Like, uh, so, uh, what are the uh, risk microbes involved in it? The low risk microbes to high risk microbes. Right. So, intensity level increases from 1 to 3. So, uh, 
one and two levels from laboratory are mainly meant for uh, the experimental training purposes. Okay, and uh, three and four are extremely uh, pathogenic in nature, and four being the most right. The so four facility is the most uh, highly uh, contained facility. Right. So uh, the risk level of the microbes they start to increase on uh, DSL three. So before working in these laboratories, uh, you should make sure that you have a uh, correct amount of training that is essentially required and essentially needed to work in the laboratory. So uh, if you see the pyramid, uh, the BSL-1 being at the, uh, the lowest uh, requires the training of the individual. BSL-2 is there, BSL-3 is there, and BSL-4. So BSL-3 and BSL-4 being on the top notch, they mainly include the high risk uh, microbes. Okay. These include, uh, but are not limited to certain bacteria, fungi, virus, ecclesia, protozoa, and parasites. Recombinant products, listed selected agents and toxins, exempted and non-exempted quantities, allergens, cultured or uh, human or animal, and the potentially infectious agent these cells may contain. So, uh, in these laboratories, there might be a certain level of experimentation that is going on, and it is essentially required in order to make sure that uh, these cell lines might be having any type of uh, infectious of uh, uh, agent inside them. Pyroids and prions, other infectious agents and outlined in the law, regulation or guidelines. Pathogenicity or virulence. Pathogenicity or virulence is the ability of a biohazardous material to produce or uh, develop a rapid, severe or a deadly disease. So, uh, pathogenicity is the potential ability of an organism in order to cause severe uh, level of infection in a population. Some materials are highly pathogenic even in healthy adults, whereas others are opportunistic pathogens able to infect only host with lower immunity or sites other than their normal habitat. Some materials uh, are highly pathogenic even in healthy adults, whereas others are opportunistic. So uh, sometimes uh, these pathogens, they readily infect the healthy population. Okay, sometimes they only target the weak individual. So it uh, wholly depends on the uh, nature of the pathogens that are present there and uh, the way they operate in the community and in the habitat. So uh, some pathogens, they uh, move ahead and infect each and every individual, but uh, there, there uh, is a category of uh, opportunistic infections also. Okay, they will only er eradicate uh, from the environment the weak individuals that are present in the population. Some biohazardous materials are attenuated on weakened and do not produce significant Okay, so uh, whenever uh, the scientists are uh, developing the vaccine, whenever they are working properly in the process of uh, developing a vaccine, so they are dealing with a biohazardous material, but uh, that particular virus has been activated by the process and weakened. So it do not pro uh, produce a significant amount of disease but it can uh, readily be utilized for the process of vaccination in order to make the humans safe from any further infection. The more severe the potentially uh, acquired disease, the higher the risk. So you can see uh, the example of uh, COVID outbreak in India. You can easily uh, determine the potential uh, risk of acquired disease and a higher risk. So, uh, what is the number of uh, 
pathogenic percentage and at what level it is causing infection and how severe is the infection and uh, what is the rate of uh, mortality or fatality so routes of entry uh, what are the different routes of entry uh, uh, an infection occurs when pathogenic microorganisms enter the human body in sufficient, sufficient numbers and uh, by a particular route which overcomes the body's defenses. So, uh, uh, in order uh, to explain these things, we can easily imagine the uh, way these microorganisms they are trying to, uh, these pathogens they are trying to invade the body. So, how do they do, do that? Uh, for that very purpose, they have to evade the immune system that is found in our body. Okay, so uh, for virus, if you take its scenario and its uh, uh, different different stages of development, you can very easily link that with many other things. Like, uh, what are the what are those things? Uh, those things uh, they uh, include that. Like for example, the HIV virus it enters the host and uh, it multiplies itself and it affects the place of uh, uh, manufacturing of T helper cells and it weakens uh, your immune system by enabling the T cells uh, not to detect it or evading the T cells or WBCs. So in this process, your, uh, the WBCs that are present in your body are completely avoiding the scenario uh, that leads to the development of uh, immune response okay and because of that your body can very easily uh, catch any infection and you, it won't be able to defend itself from it but in this process uh, you're, you're, you are not going to die because of HIV but you are going to die because of the uh, weak immune response that your body is suffering with. Uh, by understanding the mode of transmission of pathways and root of entry into the body, procedures or controls to prevent exposures and infection can be developed. So here you can easily see how the scientists are working on this uh, pathogenic agent and they are all wearing PPE kits and mask and uh, eye gear. So uh, it is essentially required in order to serve as a last line. of defense when you are working in those complex containers so these, uh, where these uh, diseases are being researched and, uh, and also at the places where vaccines are in demand so every time these co containment facilities they uh, should be developed with the following proper protocols and safety measures and also following what are the necessary steps that are taken in order to protect the individuals from other diseases. So it should not be like that. The individuals who is working in the laboratory because of procrastination or carelessness, he or she catches some infection. And uh, uh, when he moves out, he gets his family infected and all the other neighborhood infected. And the virus is infected, starts to infect the surround social surroundings. So, the proper uh, measures for the safety of the individuals and society should be taken while the person is working inside those laboratories. Inhalation hazards. Inhalation of uh, aerosolized biohazardous material is the most common route of entry into the body. Inhalation of aerosols involve microscopic solids and or liquid particles small enough to remain dispersed and suspended in air uh, for uh, long periods of time. So uh, whenever you are going to see that inhalation of these aerosols involve uh, microscopic uh, particles or liquid particles or small enough to remain 
dispersed or suspended in air for a very long duration of time. So uh, while working inside these laboratories, you should always take care that uh, all these things are maintained properly. Okay, and the individuals who are working there, they are always working, uh, covering their face and wearing masks of top-notch quality. So, and they should always uh, uh, have a proper protection. They should always wear PPE kits. Uh, the sources of aerosols include uh, aerosol, uh, aerosolized solid material like spores, dust, particulates, etc liquid material like mist, spray, coughing, spittle, putin, etc. Technical processes like blending, grinding, sonicating, lyophilizing, sawing and centrifuging. So all these things they essentially uh, should be avoided. Okay, because uh, they can readily create an environment where uh, uh, these things are very easily transmitted from one person to so ingestion of ingestion hazard. Ingestion of biohazard material occurs frequently as a result of poor personal hygiene. Okay. Uh, the poor personal hygiene practice, uh, proper hand washing uh, minimizes the opportunity uh, for the mouth and eye exposures. Examples of how ingestion occurs include like ingestion, you are ingesting something inside your body. So it is not readily uh, explained like that uh, the way you are eating something. Okay, uh, how it can occur uh, in a normal person like eating, drinking, and smoking in the laboratory. So uh, when you are working in the laboratory, there is a proper protocol that has to be followed uh, properly when you are working in the laboratory. So you should always have a proper work ethic and proper work scenario and uh, you should always avoid eating, drinking and smoking in the laboratory. Mouth pipetting, suction technique, they all should be avoided. Okay. So nothing uh, should come in your close virtual contact. The also of microbes uh, to mouth by contaminating uh, contaminated fingers or eyes. So uh, you should not touch your body parts uh, like mouth and nose or any other thing while you are working in the laboratory. You should always uh, follow the proper protocols because uh, uh, because of carelessness you might uh, very easily uh, get infected because of carelessness. So. Uh, these all scenarios are required to be followed. Uh, so when they are being followed properly, everything is easy and everything is up to the mark. Direct skin or eye contact hazards. Direct contact to biohazard material uh, occurs cross contamination and mucous membrane exposure including in the eyes, skin, inside mouth, nose and genitals. Okay, so uh, whenever you are dealing with these things, so cross contamination of mucous membrane, so you should always uh, keep an eye that uh, your uh, mucous membranes are not being exposed to the hazardous material, right? Uh, because you can very easily uh, catch infection from those things. The main avenue uh, by which biohazardous material enter the body through skin, the skin are hair follicles, sebaceous glands, sweat glands, and cuts and abrasions. So, uh, whenever you are dealing with such uh, things, you should always be uh, assured that you are not having any nicks or cuts on your hands or any other thing. So, uh, while working in the laboratory, you should always make sure that everything is okay and everything is up to the mark. So examples of how ingestion occurs. Splash or spray of biohazardous material onto eye, skin, mouth or nose. Handling contaminated equipment uh, with un, 
unprotected skin intact non intact skin if you are having any breaks or nicks or cut on the skin transfer or rubbing by contaminated fingers on your hands okay so whenever you are working uh, by wearing gloves in the laboratory they should uh, uh, be sanitized and they should be removed and uh, your hands should be properly washed and applying cosmetics or contact lenses in the laboratory so uh, the all these things which involves uh, touching yourself personally in close contact should be avoided in the laboratory setting because uh, of them you are much likely uh, to catch infection in a very easy way injection or inoculation right inoculation or injection occurs when biohazardous material is accidentally introduced in the into the body with contaminated objects through the intact skin barrier inadequate control of sharp instruments and infected animals or our support vectors the mosquitoes uh, usually result in accidental inoculation or injection okay in sharp needles were there broken glass were uh, was there that has not been yet out of view so uh, you can accidentally get uh, the hazardous material injected inside your body Examples of injections and inoculation hazards include inoculation with hypodermic needle, broken glassware, scalpels, or other sharp instruments. Sharp, uh, sharp injury, uh, needle sticks, gla uh, glass pipettes, syringes, etc. So annual bites, scratches, kicks, abrasions, punctures, all those things are uh, somewhat. Uh, injection inoculation hazard okay when you ever you are working in the laboratory you should always uh, uh, try to avoid such scenarios because uh, it can also prove a very fatal for you for your health so agent stability or viability stability and viability refers to the stability of biohazard material to retain its biohazard characteristics such as aerosol infectivity and survival time in them factors such as temperature humidity ph oxygen sunlight or ultraviolet light chemical disinfectants growth factors food reservoir or nutrition and uh, competition uh, with endemic organisms must be considered so uh, agent stability depends wholly on the and, and atmospheric conditions and environmental conditions on which it is present and it is dealing with so infectious dose what is infectious dose and how it can be uh, readily explained to you uh, the infectious dose is the number of microorganisms that are required to initiate an infection okay uh, you cannot uh, get an infection uh, depending on the number of Uh, microorganisms that are just one and two and they are present. You will always get uh, the infection or the toxicity in your body when the required uh, number of uh, pathogens is achieved. So whenever you are getting such uh, scenarios or such conditions, you should always make sure uh, that these uh, required number is needed. Okay. <coughs> Uh, this dose can range from one to hundred or of thousands of units, depending on the agent, exposure group, virulence, and host immune status or susceptibility. So, uh, what is the reason, and what are the things that depend on it? The main thing is that, and uh, the main reason is that, uh, whenever the uh, disease it takes form uh, from a single host, is that. Uh, The very the pathogen has been able to evade the host immune system, and that very pathogen has been able to multiply in such a required number that it has been able to cause a uh, you know, significant amount of infection and release of toxins that can uh, alter the conditions of the uh, normal body from inside. So this is how an infection occurs. 
So for that very reason, uh, it is always required that the pathogen should be present in the required numbers in order to cause any infectious disease. So concentration, okay, or, or the amount of the agent. Concentration is a, a number of infectious organisms per unit volume. Okay, it depends on the uh, number of organisms that are present in per unit volume. As uh, the viable agent concentration and volume increases, the risk of uh, potential gets higher. Okay, the number of volume as the volume is increasing of the pathogenic agent. Uh, the chances of getting infected are also increasing significantly. The media or the reservoir laboratory activity volume, especially that is less than 10 meters, needed to be considered in risk determination. So, uh, very uh, less amount of significant uh, volume can also be uh, proven to be really lethal to the uh, people. And uh, every time they have to. Uh, manage it and they have to look into the matter that at what the rate uh, that uh, particular material uh, is proven to be really very lethal. Okay. Immune status. At uh, uh, what level the immune system is working and how are the conditions that are being uh, uh, met by the agent. Immune status is the current condition of the living organism to resist and overcome infectious diseases. So, how your immune system responds to these pathogens and how your immune system reacts towards these pathogens. The primary function of the immune system is to protect the body from foreign substances by an acquired ability to distinguish from self and non self. So, your immune system should readily be able to uh, differentiate between the uh, cells of its own body and cells that are of uh, foreign nature. So, in this whole process, following the same uh, following the scenario, uh, the immune system is able to differentiate between uh, different pathogens that are present and uh, able to uh, readily face them for the cure of disease or the fighting uh, fighting process that involves the eradication of that very pathogen. Primary function of immune system is to protect the body from foreign substances by an acquired ability to distinguish from cell from cell, non cell. Host susceptibility or immune status help in the de determine helps to determine the level of risk of acquiring a disease upon exposure. So every time uh, you should understand the host susceptibility or immune status has determined the level of risk of acquiring a disease upon exposure. So uh, what is the amount of uh, exposure that you need in order to get yourself infected and uh, get yourself uh, passed on by lethal disease. Laboratory biosafety level criteria. So, uh, whenever you are dealing with uh, laboratory conditions, when you are dealing with those conditions, there are certain criteria that uh, need to be filled up. Uh, there are four recommendations in laboratory biosafety levels BSL1, BSL2, BSL3, and BSL4. The biosafety levels consist of laboratory practices, safety equipment, and facility combinations, which are uh, specifically appropriate for operations for suspected uh, routes of biohazards, material transmission, and regulatory functions are associated with animal uh, biosafety level planning. So, uh, there are four recommendations for vertebrate uh, animal biosafety levels. The recommendations uh, mm -hmm. below describe the practices safety equipment and facilities for experiments uh, with animals uh, that are infected with agents that cause or may cause harm or infection. So, uh, what we to 
and vertebrate animals are those are being studied for diseases they are readily being treated and uh, with the pathogenic agent and they are kept under observation 24 7. so uh, following this whole scenario there are certain levels of precautions and certain levels of criteria that should be mentioned and that should be followed in the beginning in general the biosafety levels are recommended uh, for working with biohazardous materials uh, in vivo and in vitro are comparable in vivo means inside the organism and in vitro means outside uh, in vitro means inside the glass so whenever you are working on these uh, situations or criteria you should always ensure that you get uh, top notch safety levels and top notch equipment to work on because any carelessness or procrastination can lead to uh, laboratory accident that can uh, really be uh, proven to be fatal in nature. So what are those things and what are uh, they basically uh, Those who use animals for experimental or diagnostic purposes have a moral obligation to take uh, every care to avoid cause the unnecessary pain and suffering. Okay. The animals uh, must be provided with a profitable hygienic housing and adequate wholesome food and water. So if you are taking care of an animal, it is your duty to uh, provide him uh, provide a uh, profitable hygienic housing and uh, the correct amount of food and water. Mm -hmm. At the end of the experiment, they must be dealt with in a humane manner. Okay, so if you are sacrificing the animal, you should uh, do it in a very uh, painless manner. Okay, you should not kill them for just for fun. And uh, you should always maintain the dignity of the animal. For security reasons, the animal house should be uh, independent and detached unit if it adjoins. A laboratory, the design should be provided for the isolation from the public parts of the laboratory. Um, such, uh, should such need arise and for its uh, decontamination and deinfestation. So, uh, whenever you are meeting the laboratory in class, and uh, those include proper keeping of animals, your animals should always be uh, kept in a very clean and safe manner and uh, all the needs should be properly met uh, and, and uh, there should always be in the presence of an individual who takes care of those animals okay it should not be like that the uh, person goes out on holiday or something okay yeah, when you are having animals you are always supposed to take care of them it is essentially very important and it is essentially needed every time so, uh, coming on to the animal facility containment levels. So, here we have summary of practices in safety. Animal facility containment levels are different. ABSL1, ABSL2, ABSL3 and ABSL4. So, uh, they all include uh, risk group 1, risk group 2, risk group 3 and risk group 4. Mm -hmm. And in the whole scenario, uh, this thing is uh, readily available for uh, animal facility biosafety levels at biosafety level. So, what are the laboratory practice and safety equipment required? So, uh, if you see ABSL1, limited access, protective clothing and gloves. Okay, so this is the main requirement and these requirements they keep on adding on. Okay, as the uh, facility uh, safety level increases, these things keep on adding on and uh, the requirement keeps on increasing. So, ABSL2, okay, combining ABSL practices plus hazard wa uh, warning signs, class 1 or class 2 uh, biosafety cabinets for activities that produce aerosol, right? and decontamination of waste and cages before washing. 
so every time you should uh, make sure that uh, what are the safety practices that are being followed and how uh, the equipment are being dealt with and uh, how those uh, animals uh, they receive uh, proper care and their cages are being cleaned properly or not so coming on to abslc absl2 practices plus controlled access the uh, bio safety cabinets and special protective clothing for all activities because when you are dealing with risk the risk three group of pathogens it is very really, very dangerous and in absc facilities uh, you should uh, you have to follow absl2 uh, conditions also but uh, in addition to that you are always required to wear ppe the kits person protective equipment uh, that combines the gloves and mask also but also uh, combining the uh, basic method of activity and how you have to perform the experimentation uh, procedures okay when coming out to absl4 uh, absl3 plus strictly limited access clothing chain before entering class 3 bio safety cabinets and or positive pressure suits okay the bio suits that are essential gear maybe shower to exit exit uh, decontamination of waste before removal from the facility so uh, absl4 is a top notch laboratory facility okay whenever the individuals are entering uh, they are also following the conditions that are required in absl3 the access is limited the clothing is limited and how you deal with the scenario is also limited and you also require very advanced uh, class 3 by safety cabinets where the uh, the scientist or the research individuals works individually and uh, they also wear full body suits uh, on ppe kits the body suits uh, they maintain positive pressure inside a safe environment so that person can Uh, work effect- efficiently and effectively inside the lab. Shower on exit and decontamination of all the waste. This is the most important thing. Nothing leaves the facility until it has been incinerated. Until it has been uh, properly burned by the process. Okay, so this is how all these things are dealt with, and this is how uh, one should always be. Dealing with ABSM for facilities. So in next lecture we will go through the details that are required in ABSM facilities. Now we will go through the quiz. So uh, intellectual property rights IPR is a process uh, which protects the. Use of information and ideas that are of commercial value, okay, whether it's a uh, lab or scientific setup or anything. Which of the following uh, are included in the graphical indication of goods? All the above: food stuff, manufactured, handicraft, and all those. Which of the following can be patented? Machine processes, composition of the, all of the above, all, all, all of these. PPE kits uh, serve as the last line of defense. When an individual is working in highly contagious ABSL4 or ABSL4 uh, facilities, which biosafety level is appropriate for research in microbes or infectious agents that pose moderate risk? For moderate risk, uh, you, you can go to uh, BSL2 uh, facility and. Uh, Uh, which of the following biosafety level is appropriate for this? Uh, which microbes or infectious agents that pose high risk to laboratory workers and community uh, that and are uh, typically indigenous? Indigenous means local. So a high risk facility is just followed in uh, BSL four. So, which of the following could generate the aerosol or cell sorting, pipetting, sonication, uh, tissue culturing of cells? All the above things can cause aerosol. Uh, 
crypto processing more for less in the good good speed and SMM is a high efficiency processor. So here we uh, finish our lecture. So thank you for listening to us.